Welcome. My name is Lenora Billings Harris. Chris Clark Epstein and I are partners in Beyond the Platform. I'll be acting as the producer for today's exciting webinar entitled Leaders and Culture, Four Ways to Grow and Change, Grow a Change-Friendly Organization. We'll be getting into our content in just a few minutes, but I want to cover a few housekeeping details first. You are currently muted. However, we will ask you to participate in several ways during this session. Just so we're all familiar with the technology, take a look at your control panel, probably on the right side of your screen. There is a main section as well as a smaller tab bar on the side main screen. On that smaller tab, there's a place where you can raise your hand. If you can hear me clearly, raise your hand. Okay, great. Miriam and Rebecca and Molly and several people are raising their hand. Of course, if you couldn't hear me, you wouldn't be able to raise your hand. <laughs> Next, please find a question chat space on that lower section. And just for practice, go ahead and type your current location in that pane and hit send. Okay, we've got folks from Dallas, from Charlotte, from Wausau, from Detroit. All right, we've got that technology uh, working very well. During the webinar, please feel free to send any questions in as, as they occur to you. I will monitor the questions as you send them in, and then I'll take time during the, then Chris will take time during the webinar to answer as many of those questions as possible. There is a handout for this session. If you haven't gotten it or downloaded it yet, you can find the link across the current slide. If you encounter any technical difficulties, send in a chat message and I'll do my best to resolve them. We are recording this session and we'll be sending you a link to the recording as soon as it is ready. The webinar is scheduled to go until the top of the hour and we'll honor that time commitment. So let's get started on today's topic, Leaders and Culture, Four Ways to Grow a Change-Friendly Organization. Chris Clark Epstein, CSP, is the principal of Change 101 and a partner in Beyond the Platform. Both organizations work to assist teams and their leaders during changing times. Her international client base is from Australia to Peoria, San Francisco to Cyprus, and Toronto to Minneapolis. Chris has written and contributed to 15 books, held leadership positions in her professional associations, coached senior leadership teams, and gone to all the concerts and many of the various sporting events of her five grandchildren. She's also married to Frank for over 30 years, but don't tell him that he got mentioned last. Her clients join Kim Koska, PhD, to say thank you for sharing practical tools for change so effectively. Our staff still uses them today. Well, I've taken up enough time, so Chris, the floor is all yours. Thanks, Lenora. What fun it is to be with you and all of our participants, um, especially on the day when, or the day after, we had our first stick on the ground, wake up and see it snowfall here in uh, Wausau, Wisconsin. Especially because of the approach that we're going to take today talking about leaders and culture. And I want to start by asking you all a question because I don't know where everybody is leading these days. So what I'm going to ask you to do is think about where you are a leader. It could be in your job, you could have the official title of leader, it could be that you lead in a volunteer group, it could be that you lead in a civic group, uh, but I would like you to write in the question box what area or where do you do your leadership activities? And I'll be curious to see the scope of all the different kinds of leaders that we have on the call with us today. So Lenora, I'll be depending on you to report what you're getting as people sign in. 
You bet. Just waiting for it to come in. And let's see. So uh, we've got home and business, um, a nonprofit, a business resource group, volunteer leader. I lead at home and informally at informally at work on my team of 26. Uh, another person leads the a physician's practice in higher education and within the business environment. So everybody has a place where they lead. Some, some of us have for, formal leadership roles, others of us have informal. Some of the most influential leaders in organizations are not the ones with the title of leader. For our purposes today, I would like us all to think that every one of us is a leader and a significant leader somewhere in their lives. And what we're talking about will apply no matter where it is that you lead. What I have found as I've worked with people and organizations is that, when, especially when it comes to change, everybody focuses on the what should we change, what are the ideas for change, and they are talking about the seeds part of the process. So people are looking at the seeds and they don't stop and think that it won't work to have seeds even if you have great seeds, if you're planting them in the wrong soil. Now, I have to tell you, this is why I thought the snowfall was kind of ironic, because today would not be a day that anybody would be out gardening. And I'm not a gardener myself. However, I was listening to uh, Wisconsin Public Radio, as I often do when I'm in my car, and I happened to catch a show by Larry Mueller that featured a soil scientist by the name of Kevin Shasho. And Kevin is a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and he was talking about the class that they teach that's called Soil 101. And the first thing that he taught me was that you really would be in trouble with your professor if you referred to it as Dirt 101, because there's a great distinction in the scientific world between dirt and soil. And it occurred to me that you won't find success planting the right seeds in the wrong soil. And so leaders' job is around thinking about their soil. And that's my definition of culture. Culture isn't your seeds, it's your soil. And you can't work on your culture without getting your hands dirty. So, so we're focusing on what takes dirt and turns it into the soil of the culture of an organization that allows you to make sure that the great change ideas that you have, the seeds that you want to plant, will actually flourish. So first topic is what turns dirt into soil. And what makes up soil is nutrients. What are the nutrients that go into dirt that make soil? And there basically are three of them. The first one is employee engagement. And I learned this early on in my corporate career when I worked at Blue Cross Blue Shield. All those years ago, the CEO of our organization was a man by the name of Leo Sycott, and he was a leader ahead of his time. And one of the things that you figured out pretty quickly when you worked there was that if Leo was in the building, we had a 10-story building when I worked in downtown Milwaukee, and the executive offices were on the 10th floor, or you probably could have figured that one out by yourself. But what Leo would do is if he was in the building, over the lunch hour, he'd get on the elevator and randomly go down to one of the floors where those of us mere mortals actually worked. And he would get off on that floor and he would walk around the floor and just talk to the employees. We had about 2,000 people in that building at that time. And he'd come up to your desk and he'd introduce himself. Hi, I'm Leo Sycott and um, I'd like to know what you do and what gets in the way of doing your job well. And you knew that someday Leo would show up at your desk and you'd get to chat with him. And it was kind of one of those things that made me wonder how the um, undercover boss show actually worked because Leo could never have been an undercover boss at Blue Cross Blue Shield because everybody saw him, everybody interacted with him. If you had a problem, you knew you could look out for him and sooner or later he'd hit your floor. That's the way you actually build employee engagement is how leadership, how leaders interact in a meaningful way with uh, their employees. 
that's nutrients that starts turning dirt into soil. The second thing is the customer experience. How does the customer experience your organization? And how do you as a leader know how the customer experiences your organization? Now, honestly, the more senior a person is in an organization, the less likely they are to know what it's really like to be a customer. And I happened to catch this um, in the newspaper last week as a part of her management style. Alicia Bowler Davis, who's a vice pre recently promoted vice president at General Motors, personally fields about four telephone calls a week from GM owner owners. Now, she picks up random calls. She doesn't just get the people who are calling in to say what a wonderful experience they've had with their new or used automobile. She gets them randomly, so she hears the good news along with the bad. That kind of leadership behavior keeps you clued in to the customer experience, what's really going on. The third thing that starts turning dirt into soil is your corporate citizenship. How does your organization interact with the, uh, the community that you're a part of? This is particularly important as the numbers of people in your workplace shift towards the Gen X and Gen Y um, age groups. Uh, the ability to feel as though their organization not only produces a product and creates a work experience, but also cares about what's going on in the community is a great value of the younger people coming into our workplace. So your ability to monitor how you're doing with your corporate citizenship becomes increasingly important as you try to make the kind of soil that will grow the seeds that you're planting. These three areas are are all talking about your business relationships. So how are your business relationships being tended to? So I thought it would be interesting to take a poll. So I'm going to ask you the question, and Lenora will post the poll, what percentage of your time do you honestly spend working in your soul, soil? And I know that Lenora is working to post that poll, so you can vote. and. And be honest now, because it will be interesting to see how people respond to this one. OK, about 50% of folks have responded already. So I'm going to count down from 5 to 0. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. 0.5, we got more people voting. <laughs> it's that urgency feeling. That yes. Last minute, it's, it's like registering for a seminar. Right, there you go. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. And let's see, there you go. Interesting. So I, I, lo I love the honesty. Thank you for that, because the reality is most people are so busy doing the tasks that they have to do, um, i.e. looking at the seeds, reading the seed catalogs, sorting the seeds, numbering the seeds, that they're not paying attention to the dirt. It's just there. But the problem is you get those seeds and you go to put them in dirt, they're not, no matter how good the seeds are, they're not going to grow very well. You really need to be planting them in soil. So let's take a look at, and we'll go to the next section, of if you want to turn dirt into soil, what are the nutrients that you need to have that you're working in in your soil? And I think there are three things to take a look at. And these are tangible products that you need to have no matter what organization you're talking about, volunteer, paid workplace, or your family. You need to have a clear set of vision and values. What is it that we want our future to be a part of? And what are the values that we use that drive our behaviors every day? So what does the future look like and how do we work together in those value statements? Second is, what's our service philosophy? When, when we have interactions with customers, how, how do we want them to feel at the beginning of our interaction, in the middle of our interaction, and most importantly, at the end of our interaction? And how do we want to people to talk about, about us when they're in the marketplace? So what's our service philosophy? 
policies and procedures. Boy, you know, these are like the most boring things in the world. But the truth is, if your policy and procedures are not in line with your vision, values, and service philosophies, so for example, if you have a policy that you can never spend more than three minutes on a call with a customer, and your service philosophy is about being friendly and building relationships, I got to tell you, it's not going to work. So these things not only have to exist, they have to be compatible and this is the dreaded part, they need to exist in writing. They need to be down on paper, not on a piece of paper hung in a frame in the lobby where your customers can see them when they come to visit, not as taglines at the bottom of emails, but they have to be distributed and exist around the organization in a meaningful way so that people see them. These, in fact, are your business mandates. This is how you onboard people. This is who we are. This is how you take yourself to the marketplace. So they are the business mandates that influence how you work and ultimately fold themselves into the dirt so you have rich soil for those great ideas and change process uh, improvement um, initiatives to, to grow and flourish. So I have another poll question. I want to ask you how compelling are your organizations or your departments or your family's foundational mandates? If I looked at those things, your vision and values, your service philosophy, and your policies and procedures, how would I know what your soil was like? So I know that Lenora's got the poll up. Are they well done and well promoted? Are they just average? Do they probably grow cynicism when they're referred to? Or are they not? existence. So I'll be real curious to see how you would judge yourself. Okay, you're voting a little faster this time, so it looks like you've ah, got the hang of the technology. Cool, <laughs> so. I love success. <laughs> okay, we'll start the countdown for the last five seconds before I close the poll. Five, four, three, two, one, and we're closing the poll. Let's see what you said. There's the results. Uh, this, again, thank you for your honesty, uh, because I have to tell you, I, I maybe have encountered three or four organizations over almost 30 years of doing this work where I would say that they could really honestly say that their these uh, mandates are well done and well promoted. Some of them have them well done, but then they get on a book on a shelf. Some, some of them have them well promoted, except they don't exist in a realistic way. So average and probably growing cynicism is kind of what I expected. Now, I would say that average is a better answer than growing cynicism because if your if your leaders get up to talk about your business mandates and you have people in the audience rolling their eyes you you are leaching the nutrients out of your soil and you've got some repair work to do so Lenora if we close that we'll move on because I'd like to talk about four things that all seeds need to grow. So when you plant them in your nutritious soil, you will get a product that grows really well. So the first one is that seeds grow and change, that seeds growing and changing can happen when people accept the need to change, when they understand what's going on. Now, any of you who have or have had a three-year-old will understand the very brief clip that I'm going to show you of my now 13-year-old grandson when he was three. This is Quinn. Now, I'm hoping that you're all chuckling, and, and if you have a three-year-old, that's what they say all the time is why, why, why. When people in organizations of all sorts are confronted with the notion of change, their first question is why. And I, I saw this recently, more information does not necessarily equal more clarity. This is the week where we remember back all those years ago when President Kennedy was assassinated and the iconic view of Walter Cronkite when he announced the, um, the death of the president and he put his glasses on to read the bulletin and then he took them off when he had to tell the nation 
what he what he had to tell them. And so it's not just facts and figures that create um, understanding about change. You can divide your people into three categories when it comes to change. First of all, there are those people, and you're happy about these folks, these are the people who will support the change. These are the evangelists. These are the ones who will get out in front and will uh, celebrate the opportunity, will talk excitingly about the possibilities. Evangelists are folks that you would really love that the, the bulk of your people would be in that category. Not necessarily what's happening. There'll be another group of people who are oblivious to the change. These are the people that we call acluistics. Acluistics are people who don't have a clue, but they don't even know that there are clues to be had. And you probably have some of those folks in, in your organization. These are people who are way too comfortable in their comfort zone, and they probably need to be shook up a little bit. Now, the third group is the one you really need to be careful about. These are the people who outright resist the change they will quickly turn into the saboteurs. These are the people who will kill a change initiative because of what it is that they talk about and the way they behave. Um, it is, these are the people who foster the cynicism that will kill any uh, change initiative, and these are the people who really leach the nutrients out of, of your soul. Um, your soul and your soil. So the question that I ask as you move into a people audit that is looked at from this part of our conversation is do you have the right people on your bus? Um, if you are working on your culture, you have to be brave as a leader to make sure that you have the right people and the wrong people need to be Exited, or as my friend Catherine Jeffers would say, you need to free up their future because some place there is a place for them. It just probably is not in your organization. Now, this next clip of Quinn doesn't work for three-year-olds and it doesn't work in your organization either. You are going to have to do more than just get the right people on the bus and tell them we're doing this because. Because that takes us to the second thing that needs to be a part of your soil is that people need to know what to do and how to do it. This is where we talk about our skill set. You need to make sure that not only do you have the people with the right attitudes on the bus, but you have to have the people with the right skills on, on uh, your teams. Now, one of the areas where I think this often is um, a little challenging is when you are in a volunteer situation. Because quite frankly, I bet you everybody on this call has been in a volunteer situation when, where you had people who were very eager to be a part of something, but they really didn't have the right skill sets that, that you needed. And that sometimes can be uh, tricky. So this is another audit place. This is where you need to audit the people on your team to see what they have as far as training needs and also individual professional development plans to make sure that they're positioned well. So do your people have the skill set for success? And if they don't, how are you going to get them the skill set? Um, how, how are you going to give them the opportunity? How are they going to see an advantage for themselves to get the right uh, skill set um, to be a part of the right soil for the seeds that you are planting. So that takes us to our third thing, characteristic, that we want to look at is we need people in a supportive climate. A logical project plan isn't enough. And John Cotter, the famous change guru said it this way. He said, behavior change happens mostly by speaking to people's feelings. The issues around change initiatives that don't work, generally speaking, are not about project plans that don't work or skill sets that aren't the right match. They are about people not taking care of the emotional impact that's going on during a change initiative. So it's not enough to have the right seeds. You have to nurture those seeds, and that is about a leadership audit. And you need to ask yourself the question, are your leaders emotionally intelligent? Uh, because 
they need to understand that the, the keys to the kingdom are in personal relationships with the people that they're leading. And one size does not fit all. Different people look for different phases of encouragement from, from their leaders, which takes us to our next characteristic, and that is people need to be rewarded for changing. And those rewards come in different packages. Now, a lot of people get caught up in having a huge uh, reward system that needs to be complex and needs to be funded. And, and I need you to know, and if you take nothing else away from our time together, I want you to listen to this one. And that is that the two greatest reward systems in any organization during any change initiative are leadership attention in the form of well-delivered, well-crafted and well-delivered feedback and well-crafted and well-delivered thank you. It, it is what people want more than anything else. Help me understand how what I'm doing works well in this organization. It's a conversation as simple leader to a follower with do more of, do less of, and continue. And that kind of a brief conversation that gives me a focused uh, roadmap to success is probably more than anything that you can ever give me in the workplace. And a handwritten note of thank you uh, will mean more to me if you get in the habit of doing those kinds of and I'm sorry, let me pause. Emails don't count because everybody gets way too many emails. So it's a great notion that says, I would like to hear about uh, what I'm doing and how I'm doing well. It tells me that you're paying attention to what I'm going, going through. So how effective are your reward systems is the audit I'd like you to take a look at. Not how much money do we invest, but how significantly are we doing small things in meaningful ways. So let me pause now and say to Lenora, if we have gotten any questions, this would be a good time to look at them. If not, uh, maybe you can make one up. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll just pause for a moment and see if we've got any questions. Well, I will make a comment. Several people did uh, send a, a message in that they could see Quinn very clearly, but they couldn't actually hear him. Um, although oh, you, no. yeah, but you did repeat what he said. You know, in the he was saying why in the first one and bravo in the second one. So I sent messages to them, and um, I I am really delighting with the messages that I'm seeing because people are sending short messages saying right on bravo. Yes, this makes sense. They love the terms that you're using. So no questions at this point, but it seems like folks oh. are loving what you're presenting. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad to hear that, and we'll probably have time to uh, to do that. Uh, again in in just a minute. Okay, I would like to reference, um, and I'm going to do that, I'm having a momentary lull here, okay, uh, the handout that you have. On the handout, there is a section that says a bit of self-reflection, and hopefully everybody has that. If you don't, I will talk you through it, because here's what I would like you to do is think about what we have talked through. We have talked through a lot of concepts. The first three were those um, nutrients in your soil, the employee engagement, customer experience, and the corporate citizenship. How, how are we doing on those business relationships? The second three that we looked we looked at were those foundational behavioral documents, your vision and values, your policies and procedures, and your service philosophy. The next thing that we talked about were the environmental conditions. How ready were people to accept change? How did they understand the why question? How, do, how were they equipped to deal with the change? What skills did they have? How supportive was the climate? And how were you rewarding things? Do we have emotionally intelligent leaders who watch what their people are doing and give appropriate uh, rewards? So I would like you to think uh, of the, from this list, um, which area are you best at? And what I'm going to do is put the list back up so you don't have to try to remember that. And again, type that into um, the question uh, notion. Uh, what, what area would you say you are 
sort of instinctively the best at doing. And Lenora, when you get some of those answers, you can let me know what everybody um, is saying. Okay. Actually, I'm starting to get several questions, so we'll, we'll Got it. Good. Uh, refer to those as well. Uh, we are flexible, if nothing else. <laughs> there you go. So some said that they're best at engagement. Um, P and P, and let's see what else. Uh, yeah, I, mm -hmm. interesting. The engagement. I just want to throw something out. Um, I had uh, breakfast yesterday with a colleague who is a recruitment and retention um, uh, expert, and he said when he is headhunting, he is looking for your most engaged employees. Hmm. Those are the ones that he's looking for. He is not looking for disengaged employees. And I thought, you know, that's one of those things that we kind of think if you have really engaged people, you, you are doing the right things when it comes to retention. Uh, but that was a real wake-up call for me to think, yeah, of course, if I was going to hire somebody, I want to hire somebody who really loves what they're currently doing because I think my environment is better. They'll even love it more when they come to my environment. So it seems that as people are responding, employee engagement is coming up most often. Policies and procedures, it's come up two or three times. Customer, a customer experience and supportive climate. So we do have skill sets in several different areas. Great. I, I, want, I wanted you to do a little self-reflection. And if you don't have time to do it now, I, I, in the handout, I've asked you to take all of these um, notions and do uh, a ranking. And you can do it for yourself, and you can do it uh, for your organization. Now, don't get yourself way out ahead of your organization, because organizations are made up of people just like you. So if you're rating yourself uh, a five that you're stellar on something and you're rating that same thing a one in from an organizational standpoint, that's a gap I would be looking at to be honest about. So I, I said for you to um, circle the one that you were uh, that you need to work on. So let's do that next. I'm going to put this whoops the purpose of all learning is change. Learning is about what should I do? Well, the things you're doing really well, I just want you to keep that's a more of thing. I want you to do more of that stuff. But I want you to do less of the things that you're not doing as well. I want you to say, where would I focus my attention? So I, in fact, want to know where you need to get your hands dirty. So what I'd like you to do is uh, turn your paper over and uh, pick one of these uh, areas and say, OK, this is the one that I want to work on most. So which one do you want to get your hands dirty? And if you want to type it in into the questions area, we'll see if we've got uh, collections of people thinking that the same thing is what they wanted to work on. Mm -hmm. So we might need to do some partnering here. We've got some people saying they want to do more work on policies and procedures, where in the last question there were some folks that thought they were really good in that area. Um, what else is coming up is service philosophy, acceptance of change, vision and values. You know, I, I think that it was interesting to me as I was putting this program together and thinking about it, those business mandates, um, you know, there was a while where every organization was, you know, mission, mission, who's got the mission? And, you know, vision and values, and everybody's running around doing the, the vision and values, which are really important things to do. But the doing of them, putting them on paper is not the important thing. The working with them and living with them is the important thing. So those business mandates, although they seem sort of elemental, really are so critical to being not only to motivate the folks that you've got, but to onboard people and to measure yourself. How are we doing on those things? And it's, it's sort of like, it's not sort of like, it's like a choir. If you have a choir and they're all singing beautiful music, but they all have different pieces of sheet music, you're not going to have a really good concert. I am now mixing my metaphors. I've now <laughs> gone from dirt to choirs. Uh, but, but think of those elements as your song sheet. And as a great choir director, you want to pick the best music for your uh, group to be singing. So the time that you invest on vision and values, policies and procedures, and your service philosophy is, is time well spent in the dirt. 
Mm -hmm. A few more, a few so, more came in okay, uh, that I'll just share with you. Skills for change, specifically building your own skills for change, and uh, then uh, employee engagement came up as, again as well. Great. Okay, so everybody has on the back of their handout written down one of these things, which is where you think you need to get your hands dirty first. And so now here's the second question. What is it that you're going to do first in that area? What's an idea that you have that you're going to say, gee, you know, I'm going to, I've got that book on emotional intelligence and I've had it sitting on my shelf for two years. I think what I'm going to do is actually read it. Um, uh, or, um, you know, we, we haven't looked at our policies and procedures for a long time and we've had a lot of change. So write down something that you're actually going to do that would improve the nutrition of the dirt that you've, you've identified, and then when you've got that first step idea, write that into your question thing and send it off, and Lenora will share some of those. Really thinking about this one. I got that. This is picking your seeds is what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, to realize that change can't be avoided. Write it down and do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's something magical about putting it down on on paper. Um, Lenore and I were were laughing before the women the webinar started because we have this five page checklist that we use before we start a webinar. And of course, now what we have to do is uh, investigate volume on any film clips that you use. Uh, as, as another step that we have to add to our checklist. So that's the magic of putting it down on paper. What is it that I need to focus on and then practice so I get better? Here's the mantra for change. You're going to do something new. You're going to be bad at it. You're going to, now what happens is most people do something new, they're bad at it, and they stop. That's why you need the mantra going to do something new, going to be bad at it, going to keep doing it, and then I'll get better. It is in the repetition that you get better. That's the magic of, of really having a good skill set around change. Now, I'll give you another piece of magic. The other piece of magic is to have an accountability partner. If you, and I hope you have, written you have written something down on the back of your handout, you will increase the likelihood of getting value from this webinar if when it's over, you waylay one of your colleagues, take the handout, walk them through the handout, the kinds of things that you learned, and then say to them, would you be my accountability partner? Here's what I said I was going to do. And in a week, will you ask me how I have done towards that particular action item? Lenora and I both wanted to do webinars. We have been talking about them for years. She and I are accountability partners. Finally, we said, you know what? We're not going to talk about this anymore. We are going to hold each other accountable, and that's why you're on this webinar with us today. It would not have happened had we not had that accountability. So recognize that you're going to be bad at it when you start. Have an accountability partner who will keep you honest about your efforts and you will increase the likelihood that you will put into action any new learning that you get. Any other comments, Lenora, before I wrap things up? Yes. Um, actually, we have a couple of questions and I'm going to assign one of them to you, Molly, if, to you, Chris. <laughs> I'm thinking of the person that asked the question. Um, to you, Chris, as homework, since we know we're going to be sending out one more communique to all the attendees, you can answer that question in homework. Here's one that I think you might have a minute or two to answer here live. And uh, that this question, the homework question is, how do you tell your leader they're not leading? So I'll ask you to do ah. that one for homework. Yeah, I'll, I will reserve the right to think about that. <laughs> and, and my, and my guess is you will keep me accountable to actually write that answer. Absolutely. I thought you might want to think about that one a little bit because yeah. being tactful. And then the other question, though, is what if you're leading someone who has the perfect skill set but a bad attitude? How does that impact Isn't the the soil dirt yeah is, isn't that isn't that amazing and this is sort of continuation of the um, of the um, 
gardening metaphor. This is a case of the one rotten apple spoiling the barrel. Um, le leader, leadership is sometimes about tough conversations. And I would much rather have a conversation about somebody's skill set because, boy, that's easy to quantify and easy to develop a plan of action. Attitudes, not so much. And I think that what you need to do as a leader is you need to have that kind of crucial conversation that goes like this. You, you have the perfect skill set for this project we are embarking on. I need you to know what's holding you back, you back is your attitude. And in today's workplace, on a team environment, um, attitude is as important as skill sets. A skill set will get you on the team, a skill set will get you a job, but an attitude will keep you on the team and an attitude will lose you the job if you don't if you don't do it and then talk about how can we work on this now that's not an easy conversation to have and by the way if you have no intention of ultimately forcing some level of consequence with uh, about bad attitudes don't bother to have the conversation because that's called an empty threat it's like telling the kids if you don't sit down and be quiet we're leaving the restaurant well the kids know that you're not going to leave the restaurant because you're hungry and you've already ordered the food the truth is actions have consequences and leaders jobs are to put that into the atmosphere so people understand that's what's going on it's not it's something new, it's going to be hard, you're going to be bad at it, but you need to do it anyway so you can get better at it. Great question. Okay, all right, let's wrap things up. Um, as many of you know, I end all of my programs with my favorite dead white guys quote, and this is from Seneca who said thousands of years ago, it is not because things are difficult that we do not dare. It is because we do not dare that they are difficult. My friend Lenora talks often about the Wizard of Oz and talks about courage. That's what this is all about. To be a leader that creates a, a change-friendly organization, you have to be willing to get your fingers dirty in the dirt so that you can turn it into soil so these great ideas that you have will come to fruition. And that will only happen if you have the courage to dare. It's not because things are difficult that we do not dare. Nothing I said today is all that difficult, but it is because that you do not dare that they will feel like they're difficult and you won't do them in the way that I know you can. This has been great fun to spend this time. Lenora, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you, Chris. I learned a lot, and I'm eager to put your change-friendly techniques to work and get my hands a little dirty and get into that soil. Uh, as we wrap up, there are a few things I want to share uh, and bring to your attention, those of you listening. If you have any lingering questions for Chris or any questions about you, how you or your organization can work with Beyond the Platform, please send an email to info at beyondtheplatform.com and she'll get back to you. If you, if you would like to receive my Multicultural Musings monthly e-letter, say that three times fast, or Chris's weekly brief, Thinking for Change, if you want to receive either of those, then fire off an email to info at beyondtheplatform.com. Check out the webinar section of beyondtheplatform.com to watch for information about our 2014 webinar series. It's coming up soon. When you sign out of this session, you will see a three-question three pop-up survey. We greatly it's because we want to get better, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, we we greatly appreciate your responses, and uh, we've asked a, a typical rating question, a best idea, and an action commitment to get you back into that accountability mode. We're grateful to all of you for participating in this preview Beyond the Platform webinar series. We'll keep you posted on our 2014 webinar plans. Again. Thank you, Chris, and all of you for spending this time with us. Till the next time, this is Lenora Billings-Harris for Beyond the Platform.